been an improvement in economy class. Yeah. Woo. We got one glass. Did you get a glass? Hey! And we've got hankies with our name on them. Now, if you've got your, you remember a couple Sundays ago when I spoke, Pastor felt that the ministry here needed to grade me on my performance. Well, I feel like it's turnabout is fair play. <laughs> and my voice is tired. I, you know that Pastor plays piano? I just wondered what it would be like if he sang and led worship this morning. <laughs> and maybe we could grade him. What do y'all think? <laughs> oh, well. He's halfway to Alabama, Richard said. Well, I just want you to know I'm not a quitter. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. You know what? I, I, I've been joking. Pastor, you can come back. I'm going to lead worship. <laughs> Choir, you can stand. <laughs> I hope he comes back. <laughs> Steve, I hope you've got one warmed over you can use. <laughs> He went to get his music, brother. <laughs> you know what? It's good to have it. You could stand, too. It's good to have a church where you can get together on Sunday morning and not be so stiff. Yeah. You know, it takes a lot of work to be stiff. I'm too tired to be stiff this morning. How about you? I think we ought to just worship the Lord, all right? Tell me you can come back. Yeah, you come on back, brother. I Get your music? All right. Hallelujah. Some of y'all might remember this. Holy, sing here we go. Holy, holy, holy.
gathered in the sanctuary in robed in our garments of praise we join with angels and one another to give honor to your name we sons and daughters stand before you offering our sacrifice of praise so we sing glory hallelujah to our Lord and Lord singing together we gather in the sanctuary in robe in our garments of praise we join with angels and one and all hallelujah to give honor to your name we sons and daughters stand before you offering our sacrifice of praise we sing glory hallelujah to the one and one and one come on let's sing it we gathered in the sanctuary Hallelujah. It's all right for you to worship the Lord on Sunday morning now. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. He made the heavens and the earth. Sun to give us light. His love endures forever. The stars and the moon to govern the night. His love endures forever. Celebrate your faithfulness.
Hallelujah. You may be seated if you can. I want Miss Melanie Ward to come and sing one of my very favorite songs. Hallelujah. Jesus, Father, you're the creator of all things, and you're majestic and you're wonderful. What a mighty, mighty, mighty God. Oh, eternal Father. Oh, Father, we worship you. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus.
Would you stand together, please? Hallelujah. How are you today? Very well. Y'all look great. I want to take just a few minutes and let you uh, be friendly with one another or be mean to one another, whichever you prefer. <laughs> but uh, we want you to uh, just take a few minutes and turn and greet one another. Greet about eight or ten people near you. Even move out in the aisles. I want everybody's hands shook. Bless y'all. Hey. All right, you can be seated. Hallelujah. June the 28th, 1998. Y'all realize this month, this year is half gone? Six more months, it'll be 1999. Twelve months after that, it'll be 2000. Can you believe that? Y'all are getting old, i am tell you. <laughs> this morning, um, we have an air conditioner that's down, and we have all the doors closed. We're trying to keep the cool air in here, of course. But... Um, that's why we abbreviated our worship this morning a little bit, and then I'm going to go ahead and minister just for a few minutes. <clears throat> and then I'm going to play an offertory. <laughs> I know many of you don't think I can, but uh, just keep you guessing. Um, I'm going to minister this morning just for a little while. I'm not going to go long, seriously, because we have a business meeting this morning after the service. And uh, we don't want to keep you too long because we realize the business meeting will probably last a good while. And also, we don't want to use up all of our air conditioning because it, it can get hot in here like it did last week. I think this was probably one of the best weeks of the revival we've ever had. It was awesome. It was awesome. We had uh, people in the aisles every night all the way back down, all the way down the aisles. The, choir, the, uh, the altar calls were some of the biggest I've seen. And uh, we had about um, 850 people in the overflows. So uh, contrary to what the newspaper says, the crowds are still really, really good. 
And contrary to what the newspaper says, the revival still goes on unimpeded. <laughs> We're uh, going to uh, share with you today in the business meeting for the active members of the church some uh, information that you need to know concerning rebuttals of the newspaper. I'm sure that uh, many of you uh, know Last week you saw in the paper in the editorial part where the News Journal um, had a correction. They had been accusing us and printing it in the paper of evasion of sales taxes, which is a felony, criminal act. And um, they said that that was not part of their editorial board that put that in the paper. It was part of their advertising board, but still it was put in the paper. And the community was led to believe that we were uh, on purpose evading sales taxes, which is a crime punishable by jail. And um, I would like to say that we are taking a serious look at that. And uh, none of us has ever evaded sales taxes ever. Uh, we just wasn't aware that we had to pay them being nonprofits in a church setting here. And once we found out we did, we immediately went to work to pay those taxes. So we are taking a very hard look with our attorneys at that um, uh, defamation. And uh, also, they have printed some other retractions this week in the paper yesterday, and they have one in there today concerning Mike Brown, and he'll be telling you about that in the business meeting. Friend, I want to uh, just say to you this morning, a minister, especially a pastor that's been here in this city for years, you lead as you're perceived. And once that perception is changed in people's minds of a pastor, and they no longer look at him as a shepherd, but they look at him otherwise, you lose your ability to lead. And I take it very seriously when a newspaper defames me in such a way that it keeps me from leading my congregation. And I'll take whatever steps necessary. I can assure you, I won't consult with anybody about it. I'll do what I feel like is right before God but I am not going to stand by and see my good name ruined over lies. <clears throat> I will not. And I want to say one more time, I will not do that. And I love God. I love Him with all my heart. And I have plans on being here in, in Brownsville and Pensacola for a long time to come. Yeah. Long time to come. And I want to say, too, uh, contrary to what a lot of people believe, they believe that um, maybe we are going to, uh, if the revival is ever over, we're going to spring out of here and, and not be the pastor. That's really not my plans. If the revival is ever over, I still plan on being the pastor of Brownsville Assembly. And uh, I, uh, I plan on being here in this city with a good name. I'm depending on Holy Spirit to restore and um, I'll, let me give you a scripture the Lord gave me before revival broke out. Would you like me to give it to you? Yeah. Go to Jeremiah. I'm going to preach in just a few minutes. Right now I'm venting. <laughs> one morning, one Sunday night, was having a baptismal here. Go to Jeremiah 20. <clears throat> One night... Sunday night, right before revival broke out, I forget exactly when it was, but it wasn't long before revival broke out. I'd been preaching real strong about holiness, been preaching about expecting a move of God, how God's going to show up and how He's going to move powerfully in the congregation. It wasn't anything that we were planning, but it was something we were planning for. There's a difference in planning it and planning for something. You don't know when it's coming, you just know the Lord spoke to you and told you it's coming. And I knew that it was coming, and I knew it was going to be powerful. And I'd been preaching real strong, holiness. And there were some people in the congregation at that point that didn't want to hear it. And um, some of them began to buck up against me, confront me. And, uh, and it was tough. 
Needless to say, it was tough. You know, I can't understand for the life of me, friends, if we're going to give our life for God and for the ministry, why not preach His Word? And why not do the work that God's called us to do? I'm not going to pity patter around. I'm not going to waste my life beating around the bush. Let's just, let's just get the job done and go on for the kingdom of God. And uh, I was preaching real strong holiness, you know, and, and uh, God's going to move and that kind of thing. And so uh, I was confronted by some people, and um, it was very, it was rough. It was very rough. And it went on into the night. And even while they was having a baptismal service over here, I was across the street in the office trying to deal with the situation, trying to appease and help any way that I could. But um, even the next morning, my telephone rang, and it, it was still going on. And I said, I'm not going to apologize for believing God to move in revival. I don't even know what revival at that time looked, at, looked like. I didn't know it was going to be anything like this. But uh, this has exceeded my wildest dreams about what God had said He was going to do. And so I was at home and the phone rang early that morning and the individual on the other phone just lit in again. And I, I just, I had my bait of it. And I said, listen, I've done everything I can to tell you that we're going to go forward. We're not going to be distracted at all about a move of God. We're going forward. And I don't know when God's going to move or how God's going to move, but I'm wide open for whatever He wants to do. And uh, this individual lit in again, and it was, it was rough. And finally I just said, look, I'm not going to talk to you anymore about it. I've been over backwards. I've prayed, prayed with you several times. I've been over backwards. I'm not going any further with you. It's over. And don't call here again. So I got off the telephone, and I, I, my Bible was on the nightstand. Brenda was in the bed too there. It was early in the morning. And I reached over and got my Bible on the stand, and I said, Lord, speak to me. Speak to me. And I just reached over and picked up the Bible, and it fell in my lap. And I looked down, and here's what it said. Jeremiah 20. Verse 9. Jeremiah speaking. He said, Then I said, Well, I'll not mention make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Look this way just a minute. When, as soon as I saw that, the individual was saying, just stop talking about revival. See? That's what they said. Just, just stop talking about it. Get back to normal. <laughs> and verse 9 says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more of his name, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Now look at this, verse 10. I heard the defaming of many, fear on every side. Report, say they. We will report it. And all my familiars watched from my halting, saying, Peradventure he'll be enticed and we'll prevail against him and we'll take our revenge on him. But verse 11, this is a verse God gave me. But the Lord is with me as a mighty terrible one. Therefore my persecutors shall stumble and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed. For they shall not prosper, their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. That's what the Lord gave me. And I want to just say today, and I'll be talking about this a little bit more in the business meeting, but we do have some attorneys on board, um, attorneys that uh, even others don't know about. We do have attorneys on board, and I do mean to tell you, friend, I am not going to lie down and let somebody tell lies on me and paint me with a brush in the eyes of this city where I've spent 16, almost 17 years and make me look like a crook and uh, defame us in such a way that um, you can't even hold your head up out in the city. I'm not going to allow that to happen. And uh, I know the Lord is my defender, but uh, I just cannot sit by and let my church and this revival in my own personal ministry be ruined, and I refuse to do it, and I will not do it. And so I just want you to know that. Hallelujah. Go with me, please, to the book of Luke. Book of Luke. 
Just for a few minutes this morning, I'm going to cover 10 points. <laughs> See, evangelists can't come up with more than three points. <laughs> but oh, those three points. <laughs> I think Steve's doing some of the best preaching I've ever heard him do. Yeah. Boy, it's powerful. Last Friday night was one of the most powerful messages I ever yes. heard him preach. Wonderful. If you're missing revival, friend, you're missing it. And uh, let me just say one other thing. I'm, I think I have the clearance from these other brethren to say this. I want to really encourage you to get in and what God is doing and what God is, um, how he's moving. Because you see, friends, there are seasons that God moves, but God doesn't move all the time. And what broke out here on Father's Day of 95, it, it began a season of the moving of the Holy Spirit. And it's a, it's a very powerful thing. And uh, God's given us grace and strength in this season to be here and to experience this and to help carry this out. There's times it's very grueling, very tiresome. And weariness has a tendency to set in not only in us, but in, in the worship team and uh, the deliverance team, uh, prayer teams, ushers, the television department, the video department, all of us that work in this revival, the choir. And by the way, today is uh, Teresa Castleman's birthday, the head of our deliverance team. <laughs> Teresa, where are you at? Where are you at? Stand up. God bless you, Teresa Castleman. We love you, honey. Happy birthday. And uh, weariness can set in, but you have to be, you have to understand that this is a season that God is moving. And you know, after this is over, if it ever is over, Dr. Cho says it's not going to be. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. We just, we'll have to wait and see. But I know that God will have to give us the grace and the strength to continue on. But let me just say this. If the revival should end or change in the year 2000, let's just say January of 2000, that means we've only got about a year and a half left. We've gone three years. We've gone three full years now. We're beginning our fourth year. That means if the revival should change drastically or end in the year 2000, that means we've only got about a year and a half left. If I sensed or believed that revival was going to end or change dramatically in a year and a half, I would jump in here with everything that I was and everything that I had for the next year and a half and make every service count. And uh, we don't know what God's going to be doing after that. I believe that revival is breaking out now all over the world, and we have evidence of that. And we're not diminishing any of those things, but I'm just saying... I know that Brownsville has put in a lot. I know that you put in a lot of time, and I know that we all have, and I know that we're tired. But if revival should close out by the year 2000, that means we've only got about 18 months left. And that 18 months will go by just like that. You'll be surprised. 2000 will be coming at us like headlights, just, just like that. And I'd get in here, I'd pray, I'd seek God, I'd get on the prayer teams, I'd be part of this choir, I'd be... Uh, involved in the ministries of the church to make sure that we can accommodate the wheat that God's bringing into the barns. I'd really make sure that I got active and busy and was a participant in what God was doing in this season rather than letting this pass us by and pass you by and one day look back and say, my God, look what I missed. Amen. So this is an important time. Amen. Now today I want to just take a quick look at the prodigal son, but especially his elder brother. And I want to take a look at the father. There's three individuals here that I want to look at in some detail. Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> and I will go as quickly as I can. Luke chapter 15 and verse 12 and verse 11. And he said, this is Jesus speaking, now, when Jesus look the way, look the way just a minute. When Jesus gives a parable like this, he's not only just telling a story, but he's divulging information. See, he's divulging information. He's sharing information that he's privy to in a picturesque way, in picturesque language. 
He's painting a picture. Men love messages with stories. And mo most of the people, much of the people that Jesus spoke to in his ministry were men, disciples. And so Jesus spoke in stories and he spoke in pictures. He painted pictures. But the pictures that he painted, he wanted to reveal and divulge information that he was privy to to help them to understand and get a grasp on how God is and how God is with his wayward people and even how religious people are toward their God. And so today I want to paint a picture, if I may, give a little bit of interpretation. I'm going to put my interpretation on this parable, and if you agree with it, that's fine. And if you don't, hey, I understand. But I just want to point out some things to you that I think we need to look at in regard to the heart of the Father. In Luke 15, verse 11, he said, A certain man had two sons. A certain man had two sons. The younger of the boys said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And the Bible said he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with a husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And he said, Son, and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. And he was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and said, What do these things mean? And he said unto him, Well, your brother's come, and your father's killed the fatted calf because he received him safe and sound. And the elder brother was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he's answering, said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet you never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots, and has killed for him the fatted calf, he said unto him, Son, you are ever with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right, it was meet, that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Now today, I'm not going to preach with any notes. I'm just going to talk to you out of my heart for a few minutes about this scripture. This is what's on my mind. Really hadn't had an opportunity to make notes on this. I've just got some things underlined. If you don't mind, take your pencil or your pen if you don't mind underlining or circling in your Bible, I'm going to give you 10 things to circle and underline in your Bible about this story. And I want you to see something in this story that I hope you'll never look at it quite the same again. How many of you don't mind circling and marking in your Bible? Go ahead and get your pen handy, and I want to show you something. Now, it's interesting. I've learned a good many things about, about myself during this revival. I've learned limitations. I've learned um, how much I can take. Physically speaking, I can take a lot more than I thought I could before revival broke out. I've learned a lot about pastoring. I've learned a lot about revivals and evangelism. I've learned a lot about relationships. I've learned a lot about um, um, the uh, strength 
and weaknesses of churches. I've learned a lot about jealousies in the ministry. I've learned a lot about factions and denominations. Because you see, not only am I your pastor, but since this revival's broke out, I'm in circles constantly, on the telephone constantly, in circles, going out ministering. I'll be in New York tomorrow and Tuesday. We're always going out and ministering to pastors' conferences and ministers, and we take questions and answers. We hear a lot. Uh, we hear pastors' hearts. We hear what they're going through. We hear what they go through whenever they believe in God for a move of God. They're going through quite the same things we went through here, maybe on a lesser scale. So after a while, you begin to put the pieces of the puzzle together. You begin to understand there's patterns. Whenever God begins to move in, breaks our status quo, you begin to see that there's patterns. No matter if it's in New York or Florida, people react the same whenever God begins to move in and break the status quo of a congregation or a denomination or whatever it may be. You learn a lot. I listen a lot. I learn a lot. I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot about a lot of different things. But one thing I have learned is I've learned how much I love this church. I've learned that I don't believe that God sent revival to Brownsville because of me or Steve. I believe that God could have used Steve anywhere. Really, God could have used him anywhere. I know he didn't send revival because of me. I could, when I fell back in September and died, I could have died easily. This church would have never missed a beat without me. You could have got another pastor in here. Carrie Robertson could have stepped up. Richard Crisco could have stepped up. A lot of people could have stepped up to this podium. This church would have never missed a beat. I wasn't the issue. I know that. But you were. And one thing I've learned about Brownsville is I've learned how deeply I appreciate this church going all the way back to its roots, all the way back to 1939. I, I learned how much I appreciate the charter members that had a pure heart of gold that wanted God to move and believed God to move. We have some charter members here with us this morning. Vera Youngstrom. We have um, Brother and Sister Slow here this morning. And the Brutons are here this morning. Different ones. Still charter members that founded this church back in 1939. But whenever God looked around and, and, and searched for a place that he could pour out his spirit, he knew that if he poured out his spirit in many churches, those churches would have disintegrated and folded up because they could not have taken the pressure and the heat. They could not have taken a role change for their pastor. They could not have taken people in their church night after night. And the normalcy of everyday church life, it would have destroyed most congregations. But God saw, he saw the strengths, he saw the elasticity of this congregation, the pliableness of the personality of this congregation, he saw the trust factor between the congregation and their pastor. And all of those things have been strained. I'll be the first to admit they've all been strained. But I want to, I want to go ahead and make a proclamation to you this morning, contrary to what the newspaper says. Let me make a proclamation to you that if this revival ended next week, this church is going to be stronger than it was when it went into revival. Amen. And I want to share something else with you. Whenever I first came to this city, I stood up over in that chapel across the street and I said, I can envision a church of 20,000 people. And I said, that's small. I still can envision a church in this city of 20,000 people, but it's too small. I can envision a church in this city, a major, major, life-changing, city-changing church in this city full of people revived and on fire for God and sweeping this whole county for the power of God. I can envision that. Just about 40 days from now, our new building across the street is going to be finished. And uh, we got that done in a hurry. We broke ground. Easter was a year ago, but we had to put it on hold for a while to get a, a land situation settled. And that's been settled. And in about 40 days from now, that new building across the street is going to be finished. As soon as it's finished, it'll be finished just in the nick of time 
to receive about a thousand more people that's coming into this city to become part of our school. Did you know when our school starts back up in the fall quarter, there's going to be 1,200 students in that school? It's increased by over a thousand percent since it was founded two years ago. Come on. Right now, right now, during the summer, the place is packed. We still have people here. Major crowds are still here, even during the summer. But whenever the fall semester starts back, all of our students, most of them, are going home going back to wherever they came from, they're going to be coming back. And whenever they come back, you're going to have about 1,200 students that's going to be part of this church, an integrated part of this church. And I have to be honest with you and tell you that while they're gone, I miss them. I miss their zeal and their enthusiasm and and their vision for the things of God. But they're going to be back, and that new building will be completed just in time. But I can envision a church in this city of 20,000 people. Let me, let me just go ahead and quell any fears that anybody may have after reading the newspaper. Let me go ahead and quell your fears. I want to talk to you. I'll get back to the story in a minute. <laughs> Listen to me. I have never felt better about Brownsville Assembly of God than I do today. Never. I've had people call me and give me all kinds of dreams and visions and threats and prophecies. You know. <laughs> And they bark and they send you these prophecies. And oh, it's just, they paint these horrible pictures. Some Christians live in a drab world, friend. (laughs) You know, some some Christians live in a fearful, paranoid world. I want you to know God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power (laughs) and of love and a sound mind. I can see this church as a city on a hill gleaming as a lighthouse, not only to Pensacola and Scambia County, but to the whole world. What a tragedy and what a travesty it would be if revival's over and this thing imploded and went down to nothing and you have these shells of buildings out here and people drove by and said, that's where that revival took place that destroyed that church. That's where the newspaper destroyed that church. Oh. Oh. No. Let me, let me set the record straight. They'll drive by and say, that's where that mighty revival broke out. And that's where that church was tremendously blessed. That's the place where preachers were sent out into mission fields all over the world. That's the place. Let me just go ahead and get this out. I need to make some proclamations this morning. That's the place where revival in years past had tore up other churches, but that's the place where they turned the tide and it didn't tear that church all to pieces, but it's now stronger today than it ever has been before. That's the place where John Kilpatrick did not leave his wife for another woman and she did not leave her husband for another man. The evangelist stayed true to his family, stayed true to God. He wasn't in pornography and he didn't get off into sin. That's the place where the pastor and the evangelist are still good friends 10 years later. That's the place where the congregation lost and shook off a few people, but by and large, they stayed together And they were more full of vision 10 years after the revival than they were when revival broke out. That's the way it's going to be. I want to tell you something else. Listen to me, friend. I get amazed sometimes watching the Olympics. I love to watch competitiveness. I love it. I love to see that athletic strength such as what I possess, you know. (laughs) I mean, look at this body, friend. But... uh, I love to see athletic competition. And in, 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 the, in the Olympics, it amazes me how the, the pole vault, it amazes me the discus throw, it amazes me how quick they can run, how fast they can run. It amazes me in basketball. Whenever I was coming up, nobody dunked. In basketball, you know, they, they, they'd shoot and they were good, but somewhere down the line, somebody jumped up like a gazelle, and come across that, that net and, and swish the net and, and dunked, and, and people backed up and said, who did you see that? <laughs> see? And then before you know it, after that barrier was broken, yeah. 
After that barrier was broken, somebody dumped. Somebody else said, I can do that. And so they began to train. They began to jump. They began to run. They began to practice. And what they saw, somebody else said, I can do that. And sooner or later, somebody dunked better than the first guy that ever dunked. And now you go to a high school game, a junior high school game, and kids are out there on the court dunking. Why? Because somebody showed them it could be done. That's the way I look at this revival. I said, that's the way I look at this revival. I look at this revival as a barrier breaker. It broke a barrier. And the congregation still stayed together. There may be outside insidious forces that will fire at us with 22, maybe a 410, maybe a 16 gauge, maybe a 12 gauge, maybe a bazooka, maybe a cannon. But friend, I got news for you. They will not pull this revival down. They will not do it. Let me go ahead and say it real clear. They will not pull a work of God down. It's a powerful thing. It's like this revival, this church dumped, and we broke into revival. Souls, evangelism, a school. Look at the baptismal services. Now people across America are doing baptismal services like we do them. We didn't know how to do baptism services. We just stumbled over it. But what we stumbled over became something that other churches are now doing. Other churches, we stumbled over the banner idea. Now, everywhere I go, they've got the souls banner, the revival banner, the schools banner. Everywhere I go, churches have got the banner set up. It was like we dumped for the first time. And other churches said, we can do that. We can believe God for revival. We can believe God for a move of the Holy Spirit. And I tell you, friend, instead of sitting back and being all snarled up and disgusted and pouty and being the doubt in Thomas, we ought to be on our feet saying, glory to God. Look what God has done. Woo! Look what the Lord has done. God has done some magnificent things, things that exceeded my wildest dreams. Yes. I never dreamed that God would do anything like this in my lifetime. I never dreamed the satanic attack could be so strong. But friend, the satanic attack is nothing compared to the glory <laughs> and the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to stand here this morning as a man of God I'm not standing here this morning as a hireling, but I'm standing here this morning as a man of God. And I want to tell you something, friend. I am not in adultery. I'm not in pornography. I pay my tithes. I love God and I pray. I'm not perfect, but I do try to live a godly life and I am not in sin. And I want to stand here this morning and talk to you for just a minute as a man of God and tell you this. Be at peace. Be at peace. Don't let the devil get you all riled up. Don't let the devil get you all stirred up. You just be at peace. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. He is the accuser of the brethren. But an accusation does not make a fact. An accusation does not make a fact. If God be for us, who can be against us? And I just want to share with you this morning, I want everybody here to be at peace. And uh, as far as I know, friend, there's no sin. If there was, I'd get up here behind this pulpit and I would confess it and tell you. You're not going to see this old boy crawling up behind that holy desk up there, cracking the Bible and preaching to you out of the Word of God, the Holy Writ, with known sin in my life. I'm not going to do it. And I'm just here to tell you today that God is moving in a powerful way. Forget this other junk. Let me, let me share one other thing with you too. I'm, I'm fixing to preach. <laughs> let me share one other thing with you too. When you pick up the newspaper and you read where somebody's saying things against us that was once part of us, don't you let that get in your craw. Now do you hear me? Don't let it get in your craw. You forgive them quickly. Because if you let bitterness get in your heart, you're as guilty as they are for what they're doing. And besides that, evidently there's a hurt there that we don't completely know the, the magnitude of, and we need to pray for these people and love them 
and do our best to be there for them any way that we can. So don't you get any kind of uh, revenge or bitterness or malice in your heart. You just forget that stuff. Nehemiah was on the wall, and they said, come down. He said, I can't come down. Too busy That's right. doing the work of God up here. And they accused him of everything in the world, but he stayed up there and got the job done in record time. He got the walls built and got the gates restored to Jerusalem. And I just want to tell you this, friend. I don't care what happens. I don't care if Elmer Melton turns against me. I don't care if you turn against me. We're on the wall. We're getting the job done for God. And we're going to stay there until the job's finished. Amen? Amen? We are responsible and we are accountable. We're accountable to a board of directors. We're accountable to a council of deacons. They're with us. And I've never had better support and love, never have, in any place that I've ever been. And they're still with me. Just met with the deacons Wednesday night, Thursday night. The deacons were there and we had a wonderful meeting together. The power of God was there. The Spirit of the Lord was there. Sweet. The directors are with me. I think all the directors, if not all of them, the majority of them is with me. And uh, O. Elmer Melton and different ones like that has been here in this church for years. They're still with me. If they were not with me, it hurt my heart. But still, we have to do the work of God. There's losses along the way. And uh, there's people along the way that uh, will hurt you, hurt your heart, and there's betrayals. Jesus had it. And I want to tell you, friend, if Jesus had it, you're going to have it. That's right. But you've got to pick up your chin. You've got to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. You've got to put some steel down your backbone. And you've got to press ahead. You cannot wimp out. That's right. And I want to encourage you, don't wimp out. Amen. Don't go home at night, cut that hell of vision on, and sit down. <laughs> and sit down and say, well, I'm not going to go to church. Somebody hurt my feelings. Cut that thing off. And crank that car up and come back down here and get right back in the fray. Listen, friend, if the devil can discourage you over a little minor thing, what will he do with a major thing? And I want to just share one more thing and I quit. I told a group of ministers of this recently and I, I was thinking about it. I'm 40, be 48 next month. Brenda's going to be 50 next month. She's going to be 50 and going to be 50 in, uh, she's gonna, gonna be 50 in September. She still looks pretty good, though. She ain't here this morning. So, uh, yeah, she can stay. But anyway, I don't want one day in spite of all we go through, have been through, are going through, or will go through. If Jesus tarries and he doesn't come in the next few years and we continue to age, which we will, and I'm 80 years old and she's 81. <laughs> and this church is still standing. And I'm sort of retired, not able to get around like I was and not able to think clearly as I used to think and not able to preach like I used to preach. And somebody puts a corsage on her and somebody puts a little boutonniere on my lapel and they help us in this church and probably won't be anybody much here that we know now, but the church will still be going on if Jesus tarries. I want somebody to usher us in here and set me down over here on the pew and right beside her and I want to have made it. I want to have made it. I don't want the year 2030 to come along or 2020 to come along. And they're having a big reunion at Brownsville of all the former pastors. And they're all sitting there but John and Brenda Kilpatrick. And John and Brenda split up over something stupid. And he's not with her anymore. Or John got bitter when revival broke out and he turned inward and he got quiet and he got seething resentment in his heart and he left the ministry and took a secular job. And here's all the former pastors at Brownsville here, but John Kilpatrick's not here. I don't want those days to ever happen. If none of the other pastors are here, I want me and Brenda to be here with our little boutonniere and corsage on. 
with a sweet spirit and with the glory of God still on her little face like it is and with that mean, controlling look like I've always had. <laughs> I want to I still have that old mean look. When I walk in, everybody fears it. You know, just <laughs> better straighten up. Brother Kilpatrick's here. He's 80 years old, but he'll still whoop you. <laughs> but I want to... I want it to be said, friend, I want it to be said that they held out and they kept a sweet spirit and they held out to the end. That's what I'm aiming for. I don't want my kids to be let down by their daddy. My son plays the drums here and John Michael just got married a couple weeks ago, as you know, and I don't want to let my sons down. I want them to grow up and tell their kids and their grandkids, Grandpa was a pastor at Brownsville and Grandpa held out to the end. How many of you want that to be said about you? How many of you want that to be said about this church? And so, friend, let me just listen to me for a minute. Don't applaud. Just listen to me. I don't have any plans on hightailing it out of here and leaving you high and dry. I will always probably pastor pastors, go to pastor's conferences the first part of the week, and uh, I'll probably always do that. That's where my heart is. I love ministers, and God's called me to do that. But I still plan on being here to pastor this church and to be your pastor as long as you'll have me. Don't applaud. I'm just telling you that's just the way it is. I don't plan on hightailing it out of here and leaving the church high and dry. You having to go search for another pastor in the church, whatever happens to it. I plan on, I was here when it broke out. I was responsible, and I plan on taking responsibility after it's over and not hightailing it out of here and leaving you to do the best that you can. Now, if you say that you need a vote and I need to go because I've been too polluted and tarnished by media or whatever, that's fine. You give me the vote, I'm out of here. But otherwise, I plan on being right here holding my post of duty and watching over this flock till the end. Thank you. Okay. Look at this. Going to do it quickly. Promise. Certain man of two sons. Now let's look in verse 12. Point number one. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And look what it says. He divided unto them, circle the word them. He divided unto them his living. Them. Now if you look this way, I want to explain that to you. Did you know that the eldest son usually in an inheritance situation usually got more than double, at least double, of what anybody else would get? The oldest son would get double. But in order for the father to give away his inheritance because the younger son came to him and said, in effect, I wish you were dead, I wish you'd drop dead so I could get what I've got coming to me. It looks like I've got no other wealth, no other way of getting any wealth and living the kind of lifestyle I want to live unless I get your stuff and I can't get your stuff as long as you live and I wish you were dead so I could get your stuff. The father had to divulge himself of his stuff in order to give to that younger son what the younger son asked of him. But I want, I want you to understand, not only did the father give to the younger son what the younger son had coming, but he gave it to the oldest son also. His older brother, the Bible calls him the elder brother, the elder son. So the father divulged himself of his assets and he gave it to them. Underline that word them, circle that word them. It said the younger son said, give me, but the Bible said the father gave them. Now do you know what that means? It means that the younger son got what he asked for, but it also means that the older son, the elder brother, the elder son also got his stuff. Now, the second thing that I want to bring to your attention about this story, it says in verse 17, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants have my fathers got bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I'm going to rise and go to my daddy and I'm going to say, daddy, I've sinned against heaven and before you. And verse 19 says, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. Look this way, everybody. I want to tell you a very important point. Did you know the devil is so sneaking and he's so sly? Who put 
it in the mind of that younger son to go to his daddy and ask for his inheritance. That wasn't God. That was carnal. It was devilish for that boy to go to his daddy and say, I wish you were dead so I could get my stuff. That's rebellion. That's not honoring your father. That comes from a demonic origin. The devil talked to that boy, and the devil said to him, go get your stuff. Ask your dad to give you your stuff. But now the younger son goes out. He's got his stuff. He goes into a far country. He wastes his living with riotous living. It's all gone. And the Bible said no man would give to him. He's starving. Would have filled his belly with a husk. But then the Bible said he came to himself. Now, that's a serious thing when you come to yourself. Because when you come to yourself, you better recognize what voice you're hearing. How many of you know there's three voices that you can hear? There's the voice of the devil. And you have to let the Holy Spirit be your umpire. He has to call the shots when the ball comes across the plate. Ball! Strike! The Holy Spirit has to be the umpire when you start hearing voices. You see, if you hear a voice that tells you to do something that contradicts the word, that's not God, that's the devil. Ball! When you hear a voice that speaks gentle like a shepherd and is edifying and constructive, that's God. It lines up with the scripture. It's constructive and not destructive, and it's edifying, and it's doctrinal. Strike! God's speaking to you. But how many knows there's another voice? It's your voice. And it's hard sometimes to delineate your voice from the devil's voice and from God's voice. How many of you knows that the Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is what? The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. You know what that means? It means you can come up with some schemes and ideas that's deadly, and God ain't got a thing to do with it, neither the devil got anything to do with it. It's out of your own deceptive black heart. Y'all with me? And the Bible says that this son came to himself, and here's what he said. Now, the Bible says there's a way that seems right to man. This, this son that was a prodigal came to himself, and here's the way he began to talk to himself. Well, gee, Whitaker, I'm hungry. Man, there's stinking hogs down here. Boy, I, I ain't got nothing enough. Nobody's helping me. And so he began to think. And he says to himself, you know what I'm going to do? Hey, I got an idea. I'm going to go home, and I'm going to ask my daddy to make me a servant. I'm not going to ask my daddy to make me a son, because I'd be too presumptuous to ask him to make me a son, especially after I said, I wish you'd drop dead where I can get my inheritance. I'm going to ask my daddy to make me as one of the hired servants, because they got plenty to eat. And I won't live in the house with daddy. I'll live out back. I'll live out in the guest quarters. I'll live out in the servants' quarters. Hey, that's what I'll do. Daddy, would you make me a servant? And, 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 and don't dare think about me even coming in the big house where you are, Daddy. I'll just stay out in the servants' quarters. Now, was that God? That was not God. That was him. And I want to show you in just a minute the pickle and the place that God gets in so many times with people. And so many times God comes up at a loss with the workings of the devil and God's people. Now watch this. The younger son comes home and he says to his daddy, his daddy saw him running and daddy took off running when he saw him afar off and he fell and kissed him. And the, and the son spoke up and said, Daddy, I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore. Make me as one of your hard servants. And the daddy didn't even respond. He just turned to one of the servants and he said, Go get the fatted calf. Go kill the fatted calf. Bring me the robe. Bring me the ring. And get me some shoes to go on this boy's feet. What he was saying is, get me the emblems and the symbols to restore sonship rights to this boy. I don't want to hear him talk like that anymore. Oh. Amen? Now, he didn't even respond to that boy. But the boy had it in his heart. First of all, the devil told him to do that to his father. Now the devil comes along and says, don't even think about being a son again. Now look this way, everybody. Now, you see, Daddy lived in the big house. Daddy lived in the main house. That's where Daddy is. That's where peace is. That's where provision is. 
That's where the masculine figure is. Daddy's there. Everybody wants to be around daddy. Everybody wants to talk to daddy. My boys love to come and get with me at nighttime and just sit and talk to me about things at nighttime. A lot of times after revival. I got home last night after revival. I heard the doorbell. Ding dong. It was John Michael. The reason they're not here this morning, Elizabeth's sick, and they couldn't be here this morning. But John Michael came down last night, and he, he said, uh, Daddy, how you doing? I said, oh, I'm doing fine, man. I had to go study, you know. And I had to go up to the house and get ready for today and get ready for the business meeting and all. And he just, he wanted to talk. So I sat down there and I talked with him. I rubbed his old noggin. You know, he always likes me to rub his head. And I'd rub his head and talk to him. <laughs> Married boy, laying about like an old dog, you know, and I'm rubbing his head. <laughs> <laughs> Don't y'all tell him I said that now. But, uh, they like to talk to daddy. They want that fellowship. They want that sense of belonging. So the devil comes along and says to that prodigal son, said, just go home and don't ever think you could be a son again. I want to tell you something, backslider. The devil will talk to you and tell you that if you're going to come back to God, that you can never go to the big house and enjoy God again as your father. The best you can come up with is to be a servant and to be treated inferiorly but I've got good news for you. The Father's not like that. I said the Father's not like that. He's not talking about servanthood. He's talking about sonship. And the devil put it in his mind and said, don't even think about going to the big house and being playing on the floor with daddy and rolling and romping with daddy and playing games with daddy anymore. Don't even think about that. You've done so bad, you could never enjoy the Father again. I wonder how many people in our churches, how many pews in our churches are filled with people that's done so bad and they've come back to God out of a fear mentality or they've come back to God out of an emergency mentality and there they sit, they pay their tithes, they sing their songs, but they never go in the big house and enjoy fellowship with daddy because they think they've done so bad, daddy won't forgive them. And they think that daddy looks at them as a servant. But friend, I'm going to tell you, we're no longer servants, Galatians says, but now are we the sons of God. And the Bible said if we're sons, then we're heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. But I like this next point. Number three, I'm going quickly. Look at the next point. Y'all stay with me? Well, the next point was I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Verse 23, I'm sorry, verse 25. Now the Bible said his elder son was in the field and as he came and drew nigh to the house he heard music and dancing and he called to one of the servants and asked, what do these things mean? Now I want to just stay there just for a second. I like this. Did you know you can become so religious? Did you know you can become so perfunctory in your relationship with God? Remember the elder son said to his daddy, I've kept your commandments. I've never deviated one bit. And daddy, you never killed a calf for me and my friends. See, he was saying, I've been perfunctory. I've kept your commandments. Yeah. But if you had a relationship with him. Amen. You know something? You can get so perfunctory in your relationship with God. You can get so legalistic and you can get so religious in your relationship with God, that the Bible says the elder son came home and he heard the music and the dancing, and you know what he had to do? He had to ask, what is that I hear? Yeah. Come on. Come on. People are shocked when they come in Brownsville and see us so loose here. They see the dancing and the jumping and the twirling and the singing loud and Lindell up there shaking his hair. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and we're having a good time and people are smiling and people are dancing and they're running and they're, they're shouting and they're, they're, they're glorifying God and people come in and, and they're saying, what does this mean? Even on the day of Pentecost, the Bible said they asked the question, what meaneth this? Did you know, friend, that the elder brother had gotten so religious and so backslid and so dry that when he heard music and dancing, he didn't even know what it was anymore? I think in many of our Pentecostal churches, we become so dry and so perfunctory that we forgot what revival's all about. And they said, what's this? What meaneth this? What, what's, what do I hear here? 
And somebody had to say, oh, they're, they're, they're dancing and they're rejoicing and there's music going on because your brother has come home. And it's interesting to me because the Bible says that when he heard that they'd kill the fatted calf, the Bible says that he was angry. Look at this. Look down at verse 27. It says, Thy brother is come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf because he received him safe and sound. And verse 28 says, He was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And that word entreated him means he begged him. I want to show you a picture of today's church. Y'all listening? Let me show you a picture of today's historic church, a church not in revival, historic church, traditional religious church. Let me show you a picture of it. Daddy's inside, a backslider's come home. There's music, there's dancing. Now, let me show you a picture of Daddy for a minute. Let me show you a picture of God the Father. The devil tries to rob God every way he can, and many times he's successful. Let me show you how the devil really succeeds in robbing God of so much pleasure. Now, here's Daddy in the main house. Daddy was there by himself because the elder son had his own quarters. And the boy was coming home, and whenever the boy was coming home, the devil lied to him and said, don't go back up there and think you can have fellowship with Daddy. Why don't you go and ask your Daddy to make you one of the servants and live in the servants' quarters? Here's the father missing his son, his backslidden son. And here's the father that's got a religious son out there. And the religious son's serving him in a perfunctory way. And the father's in there saying, won't somebody come in here and let me have fun with them? How many of you know the Bible says all things were created for his pleasure? All things were created for his pleasure. God created you for his pleasure. God's not tolerating you. God loves you. And God wants you to fellowship him. You might be sitting there saying, oh, I don't believe God wants me to fellowship him. You know what? You know so much about yourself, you don't think anybody else can love you. God loves you. God loves you. But here's the father in the house, and the devil tried to cheat him in, from enjoying that backslidden son by telling the son, go out there and live like a servant in the servant's quarters. And then the elder brother out there, the father had to go outside the house and beg the elder brother, why don't you come in here, son? Your brother's in the house. Why don't you come in here? Your brother that was dead is now alive again. Come on in here and let's have a, let's have a good time. Let's have a party. Let's have a festive time. Your brother's back. And the religious historic church of today wants no part of backsliders and sinners. Y'all hear me? You know, many of you could have easily said when revival broke out, Brother Kilpatrick, you gave away my seat. You let somebody come here and take my seat. We've sat in this seat for years. You let somebody get my parking place. Pastor, I can't believe we parked in that parking place for years. Let me tell you about that fatted calf. You know why the Bible says that elder brother was angry when he found out that the father had killed the fatted calf? Because that wasn't the father's calf anymore. That was the elder brother's calf because remember he divided it among them. So when he came home, here's his brother in there and there's music and dancing. That always makes the historic church upset. They don't want no part of festivities. They want to get in the word and be so strong in the word, but no fun, no enjoyment, no enjoyment of God. They don't want to be in the big house with daddy and enjoy fellowship with daddy. It's, everything is legalistic. Everything is rigid. Everything is, is law. Everything is keeping the commandments and not deviating. I've never deviated one time, daddy, but now there you are in there with that boy. He's deviated. He's been with prostitutes and he's wasted his share of the living and you're in there loving on him. You're not loving on me. God would if we'd give him a chance. I'd like to say to the church today, if we'll let down and get rid of our legalistic attitudes and get rid of all this legalistic stuff and let our hair down, God would take us in his lap and love on us. He'd romp in the floor with us and we'd have great times of fellowship with him. God wants to throw a party for his people, friend. 
Somebody says, oh, but the Lord, we've got to do this and we've got to do that. Sure, we've been doing that, but now it's time to enjoy the Lord. For thy pleasure all these were created. But see, whenever the father killed the fatted calf, he was killing that elder brother's calf because the father divulged himself of all of his assets, and now the other boys wasted all his stuff, so everything's in the elder brother's possession. And so when daddy said, kill the fatted calf, he said, you mean to tell me you took my calf and killed my calf for that reprobate. You know what the historic church is saying today is they're seeing backsliders come in their churches, stinking, smelling like alcohol, Many of them high on drugs, and they see them coming in this church for revival. Many of you could have had the attitude, Brother Kilpatrick, you gave away our pew. You gave away our parking place. Now, we, don't even, we can't even hardly get in our church. Look at all these people sitting in this church, looking like that, acting like that, smelling like that. Yeah, but you've got to understand the Father's here, and the Father loves these backsliders coming home. The Father loves it. Don't. Don't, be, you know, the only one in this whole story that's got any good sense is the daddy. Both the boys are messed up. I said both the boys are messed up. One boy was disrespectful to his dad. He was messed up. And the other one is messed up because he's so religious. Don't be like that. Don't be like that where daddy has to leave the party and you're outside pouting. And daddy goes outside and he says, son. Hey, buddy, you been working hard today? Yeah. Hey, man, how's the cattle doing? Well, I appreciate you giving me all that stuff, Daddy, but the cow's doing fine. But there's one calf I'm concerned about. <laughs> How many heads you got, son? 14,000? <laughs> but I'm upset about that calf that you killed today. Oh, how possessive we get. Oh, how stingy we become. Let us not ever learn to sit in church with a knife in one hand and a fork in the other hand and a napkin around our neck. And sit in the pew and say... <laughs> Feed me, preacher! And we bang on the table. Feed me! Give me more! I want to go deeper. I want more knowledge. I want more truth. <laughs> How many head of cattle you got, son? 14,000, but I'm upset about the one. What you upset about? You kill my calf for that rascal. Come on, Pastor. Come on. I think it's time that the church today grows up and gets our eyes off of ourselves and gets our eyes on what God is doing. And friend, listen to me. I want to tell you something. I've said this so many times, but the church is not supposed to be a museum where we muse over one of those gifts and talents. I've got the gift of interpretation. Oh, my God, do you really? <sighs> I've wanted that since I've been 12. Somebody else says, I've got the gift of discernment. Oh, oh, man, discernment. I've got the gift of tongues. I've got the gift of faith. And we muse over one another. Oh, you look so good. What's that you got on that smells so good? And we muse over one another. The choir and the preacher and the stained glass windows and everything. We just muse over one another. We're in a museum. God never meant for the church to be a museum. That's religion. God meant for the church to be a hospital for sinners. Where the sick come. Where the demon possessed come where the backsliders can come. But today's church has lost sight of our mission that God's called us to do. And then when God does do something and God does bring in a backslider or God brings in somebody that's got tattoos all over them and they smell like a cesspool, we say, you killed my fatted calf for him. Come on. Amen? Well, look at this, and I close. Aren't you glad, let me just say this while I'm thinking about it, aren't you glad that that prodigal son didn't face his elder brother before he faced his daddy? Aren't you glad that the prodigal son didn't face his elder brother in the field before he met his daddy? Because if he'd have met his elder brother, there'd have never been this story in the Bible. That's why I'm so thankful 
for the guards outside. That's why I'm so thankful for the ushers. You see, before the altar call is given and, and the people crowd up here to these altars to meet the Father, they met a lot of the Father's representatives out there in the hot concrete. The ushers holding the ushers' bags with a smile on their face, joy in their heart. Oh, hi, where are you from? It's so good to have you. They're good elder brothers. And they'll say, oh, you're hurting, you're sick. Oh, you've been away from God. Oh, listen, you're in the right place. In just a few minutes, our evangelist is going to give an altar call. And when he does, go down there and accept the Lord. But I wonder what would happen to that prodigal son had he met the elder brother before he met his daddy. That would have never been in the Bible. Let me close. Look at verse 30. It says, but as soon as this thy son, this is the elder brother talking to his daddy, as soon as this thy son. Did you know the elder brother wouldn't even call his brother his brother? See that? He said, but as soon as this thy son. Now here's the elder brother talking to his daddy, and he's calling his other brother, the prodigal son, thy son. You know what I'm hearing preachers say as I go around in pastor's conferences? You know what I'm hearing them say? Brother Kilpatrick, it's the strangest thing. God's moving in our church. It's growing. We've grown 30%. We've got all kinds of newcomers in. We've got drug dealers in the church. We've got former prostitutes in the church. We've got lost teenagers that, that parents have prayed back in the church. And he said, now some of our older people that's been there in the church for years has moved off to other pockets of the church and they won't even have anything to do with them because they're jealous. You see, when Jesus gave this story, this, 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 this uh, a parable about the prodigal son, he's divulging what he knows. Jesus knows, see, and he's trying to paint a picture, and he said, even the elder's brother wouldn't even call the prodigal son his brother, and it's his blood brother. They inherited together. And he said, this thy son. You know, one of the things I can thank God for in this church, the newspaper may say it, and some people that's left the church may say it, but I don't sense any attitude in this church at all about anybody saying, those people, that man. We're just all integrated into one big body here. Amen. All integrated into one big body that loves one another. We sing together, we worship together. And you know what? I don't think the most vicious and the meanest of sinners has even got saved yet. I think they're yet to come. I think God's been testing us. And I think God's been trying our mettle by sending so many things to us, and we passed the test so far, but I believe now that God's about to bring on even some stronger and greater stuff. Okay? I close. In verse 31, he said, Son, you're ever with me, and all I have is thine. When he said, all I have is thine, he was really telling the truth because he said, I don't even have anything anymore, son. I'll give it to you boys. He said, you're ever with me, and all I've got is yours. He was really telling the truth. All I've got is yours. I've already given it to you. I don't have nothing, son. When I took that fatted calf, and I killed that fatted calf for your brother, I thought you'd rejoice. And then the Bible says it was meat. What that means is it was right that we should make Mary and rejoice and have a good time and have a party because your brother that was dead is now alive. He said, it, it was right. When I read in the paper statements made when we were in Houston about people screaming and shouting and singing loud and it's more like a concert. The church has become so used to the abnormal that when the normal shows up, they don't know what to call it. And the Bible even talks about those that know the joyful sounds. We hadn't heard joyful sounds in so long in our churches, we don't even know what they sound like anymore. But God is restoring. God's bringing the backsliders in. And I want to tell you something, friend, it's not going to stop. You might as well get used to it. But I want to ask you a question today in closing. Who are you? Who are you? Are you someone that has sinned? 
and you've thought about coming back to God, but you say, well, if I come back to God, I could never think about having fellowship with the Father anymore. I could never think sonship. I've got to think servanthood. Some of you in this building may have been living for the last 30 years of your life under servanthood. You may have been living the last 30 years of your life thinking, I've got to really prove to God now. I know he takes care of me, and I know I pay my tithes, and I know what God watches out for me, but I could never have the relationship I used to have with God when I was a kid or when I was a young man, a young woman, because you've got that mentality, you see, that if I go back home, I'm going to have to be a servant and live out in the servants' quarters. And many of you still got that. You don't know how to enjoy God. Friend, I want to tell you something. God wants you to enjoy him. I get up in the mornings, I enjoy the Lord. He's the best friend I've gotten, the most faithful father that you could ever hope to have. But I want to ask you question number two. If you're not the prodigal son, are you the older brother? Are you the older brother that has an attitude about having to give up something for what God is doing, about having to forfeit something to accommodate what God is doing? Are you upset with the pastor because he's opened up your church to be trampled by the feet of the world? Are you upset with your pastor because he's let festive, joyous music come in and the religious music is no longer there? Now there's merriment and dancing and shouting and laughter and singing. Are you upset about that? It probably proves that you've got an older brother mentality. But the one I feel sorry for out of all of this is the father. Here's the father that wants both those boys in his house. The one son, the devil said, just go live in the guest house. And then the other son's outside and won't come in. I feel so sorry for God because he gave his son to die for all of us. But yet he looks down on his body and it's split. One says, oh, I'm a servant. I can never romp on the floor with daddy again. And the other one says, no, I ain't coming in. I'm disgusted with the whole mess. I don't want to be like that, friend. I want to be right in what God's doing. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. As um, Pastor was sharing, I was um, thinking of the, the hobo that came in. How many were here and heard that story last week? Patrick, who uh, came to the revival a year and a half ago, looked like Charles Manson, and uh, just right off the streets, had been on the, the streets for 40 years. He was a junkie. Matter of fact, he'd been in San Quentin for 15 years of his life. And uh, he came in on a train and was sitting in front of Subway Sandwiches and someone from this revival went down there and invited him to the church. And he came in and when I saw him, you know, I just, you know, that's a long road to hold, God. <laughs> that's, that's some work there. And because uh, I remember me <laughs> and it's just some work. And uh, he got so saved, it scared everybody. You know, the prodigal got, I mean, he just got right, just like that. He got right. This guy got so saved, then he met a girl in line and uh, fell in love with her and went up to Ohio and wanted to marry her. And what I'm getting to is a, uh, that girl had been in that church a long time, and the pastor of the church called Kerry Robertson many times, at least three times, and he said this, look what you've done. He said, I send one of my finest parishioners to your revival. And she goes down there and picks up a hobo. <laughs> and Carrie said, he was a hobo. He's now a Christian. He's now living for Jesus. And the pastor just occurred to me, and, and, and the pastor goes, she deserves better. You've got to put a stop to this. That's what he told Carrie. Carrie said, put a stop to what? They're going to get married. Carrie goes, good. <laughs> They're in love. God put them together. And then we saw them. They came to the revival. Had a little child, Emily. He's working a job, living for God, going to a different church. Isn't that sad? They had to plug into a different church because of that elder brother mentality. It's pitiful. That just occurred to me as you were preaching that. That's exactly what happened there. And now, don't you know that that one pastor would love to have that couple back? 
Now, they have, now, they're, now they're what every family pastor wants. They got a family. They're of that yuppie mentality, you know. They want that yuppies in the church. They want the 40s in the church and the early 50s in the church. They're growing family. Both got good jobs, tithers. But boy, just couldn't handle it at the beginning. Wow. That's good preaching, Pastor. Before we pray together, I would like to say that um, as the evangelist, you know, I'm a visiting evangelist here, just passing through. <laughs> but uh, uh, no one knows how long this revival is going, okay? Um, for those of you that uh, are concerned about the Awake Americas, we do Awake Americas all over this nation. And the majority of the people that come to Awake Americas have never been to Brownsville, and most of them would have never come. If they're not going to come after three years, okay, when we announce in these auditoriums and these stadiums, 80% of the people have never been to Brownsville. And a lot of these are standoffish people. But they'll go to a coliseum, a secular coliseum, where they just saw a rock concert or just went to a, a country concert. They'll go there to hear this Brownsville team. And so those Awake Americas are just an extension of this revival. And it shows me how healthy this revival is that we can fill up stadiums and coliseums all over the nation. That's amazing, Brownsville. And it's amazing to the cities to see people lined up around the coliseums trying to get in all day long. It shows the health of this thing. So no one knows how long this thing is going to go. When Richard announced that 4,000 teenagers are going to be at the Civic Center next week. Think of that, friend. And let me tell you something else. They're not coming to hear Petra. They're not, they're not coming to hear Carmen. And they're paying. That's a miracle. For 4,000 teenagers to pay is a miracle. To come to this thing, it shows of the health of the Brownsville revival, friend. And so we don't know how long this thing is going to go. I'd just like to share with you about the, the revival, the, um, the school of ministry. Uh, we... Um, we believe that the Revival School of Ministry is going to become a, like the point of a spear. And it already is, but it's, it's a baby. And when we sat with Thomas Trask, the superintendent of the Assemblies of God, it was like he was salivating over the school. He was, it was like this Brownsville Revival School of Ministry is the answer to prayer, that this thing is birthed in revival. And he knows it's the future of the Assemblies of God is that fire that's coming out of this Revival School of Ministry. And so we have, just to let you know some of the things that are going on, we're looking long-term. How many love looking long-term? I hate, I hate fly-by-night things. That's why I'm a church planter. I like to go back 10 years later and see the church and the people we won to Christ. We're looking long-term. And we have the Assemblies of God Maps Department, the Missions Department coming into the school in November. They're going to come and interview students and they're excited about it. Why? Because they have about 2,000 openings all over the world where they want to they see some of these students. Now, all the organizations, other organizations want these students too. But the Assemblies of God really want these students. And they want to plug them in to Ethiopia and Bangladesh and the United States. There's works all over the United States. And they want to see these kids not only go through the school and graduate, but see them 10 years down the road, an active part of the Assemblies of God missions program. So there's a lot going on here. And I want you to know that this evangelist, we have purchased property here. We're building a home. Bob Rogers has just bought a home here. And we're planning. I want my kids raised at Brownsville. I want my children, my little kids, my three-year-old runs up to this man and jumps on his lap and says, hey, pastor. And she knows that's, it, that's her pastor. And when she's giving me the devil, you're going to take care of her, brother. <laughs> so we're looking at everything long term. And so uh, with, I, we say the year 2000 because people look at the 2000 as sort of a you know, a capsulizing of the millennium, you know, and, and so who knows? This thing may go on for years after that. But uh, give it everything. I agree with the pastor. We are diving in. Between now and the year 2000, I'm saying Jesus, because I can't think anyway past a week. But we're going, Lord, we're going to give everything we have. Because I want to see millions saved, friends. 
I want to see millions come to Jesus all over this nation. Lord, would you do that? I want everyone to stand with me right now. Everyone in the chapel, I want you to stand. I want to ask you a question. I want you to be honest. This has been an awesome week of revival. It's been phenomenal. But this week is over. Today is what God is interested in. I want everyone to listen to me. Are you here today and you've got that elder brother mentality? I'm going to start with him. We're going to close. But the elder brother mentality, things have been bothering you. Let me put it in real practical terms. And Pastor already has touched on several of these about your pew, about your parking place. But let me tell you about love. See, some of us here have got the Father with us always. Okay? And these prodigals are coming in. They've been away from the Father. And they've been away from a pastor. And you'll see this man right here loving on them. And you might think, he used to love on me that way. He used to call me. He used to visit with me. He used to do this and he used to that. But now he's loving on these new people. Friend, get excited about that. That's awesome. There's, an, there's a gut appreciation for Brownsville, always will be. You're the prize and joy. Of, you're, you're, the, you're, the, you're the pride and joy of the pastor and the pastoral staff. But these new folks that are coming in, and I look at them this morning. I see them out there. They've just joined the church. They've never been around anything like this. And they're going, man, if I could just get with John Kilpatrick and just tell him how much I love him. And so they make an appointment. And the, the family, the young family, the man and the, the, the wife and the little child sit in there for a half hour in the pastor's study, and he loves on them. They've never been around a church, and they're just loving on them. And then they get up and they walk out, and as they walk out of the office, you're walking by the office, and you look in there and you're going, I've been trying to make an appointment with him for two years. And I know these people just now got to this church, and look at them, they've been in there sitting with the pastor. It can get in your system, friend. It can get in your spirit. Shake it off. Shake it off. Say, Jesus, ain't no way. If this church grows to 10, 15, 20,000, I ain't going to let no bitterness, no, 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 nothing get inside of me but love the, what, of what you're doing. Love for your big family. So if you're here today and some of that's gotten in your system, you're going to ask God to forgive you. And there's others here that you are the prodigal. God has gotten you here. He's brought you here. And you need to be forgiven. There's something in your life between you and God, and you need to be forgiven. We're not going to have communion this morning because of the, uh, the business meeting that's immediately following this prayer. But we're going to ask right now God to forgive us. Everyone listen up in the chapel. Everyone in this main auditorium. As a matter of fact, this is what, I don't want anyone to raise their hands today. I really feel that what, what we just all need to do, we're going to all pray this prayer. Everybody's going to pray this prayer. Maybe you've never had that happen. Maybe you've never had that happen, that something's gotten into your system. But maybe it's about to happen. Maybe something's about to happen. I wonder what would happen if Russ jumped out of the wheelchair one day here. You know, he's already been saying words. He's been saying full words. He's, there's one time I came up to him and said, hey, Russ, and he goes, look straight at me, and I'm going, God, this is scary. I mean, Next thing is, you know, lifting his hand and shaking my hand. I mean, what's after just raising his head and looking straight at me? You know, what's, what's going on? What would happen if one day he just jumps up and begins running around the church? What would happen? I want to tell you what would happen. I want to tell you what would happen. The line would stretch all the way down to 110. Forget your pew. You'd be lucky, friend, if you got a chair in the nursery somewhere of people trying to get in. Would you grow bitter? Or would you say, Jesus, you've healed Russ. And now, and now it's in every major newspaper around the nation. Now, now doctors, cancer doctors, and AIDS patients, they're being sent to Brownsville for healing. What would happen, friend? What would happen? You'd be saying, thank God I still got my ticket for Sunday morning. Thank God I can still. <laughs> but that's where I'm looking, friend. I'm looking for an explosion. So get ready. Everyone pray with me. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. No, everybody, friend. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Thank, you thank you that you put me here. You put me here. 
I'm where you want me. And Lord, I confess any sin in my life that you had washed me clean. Get rid of it. I don't want it there. Cleanse me. I repent. Jesus, I confess you as Savior. Be my Lord and my very best friend. Jesus, from this moment on, I am yours and you are mine. Come live your life through me. In your precious name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, name. amen. Amen. Glory. I want Lyndall, come on. Come on, team. Before we go into a business meeting, we gotta sing a song. I mean, something up, brother. You got something up in you? Old time religion. (laughs) We're gonna, I preached the old time. Give me that old time religion last night. So somebody said the old time religion. Something different besides that, though. Okay, something. What you got? Something, something up. Hallelujah. Business meetings are up anyhow. You know, don't, don't go. Oh my God, a business meeting. No. Those of you that are visiting, I mean, you're, you're, you you don't come. want to do. When the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. No, no, no. no. When the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not hold the fort or anything like that. Just, huh? Why not? If God has been so good, and then after this song, after this song, Pastor's going to take it. Everybody sing this with us now. That's about as up as it gets. Pastor will be doing a solo on this one. One, two, three, and... So good to you. Come on and praise Him. If God has been so good, come on and praise Him. If God has brought you through, you are to praise Him. You know the Lord has been so good. Why don't we praise Him? Sing away, my skin. Come on and praise Him. If God has been so good, why don't you praise Him? Took away my care. Come on, church.
Now, if you're not a member of Brownsville, you can be dismissed. And those from the chapel, those of you that are members of Brownsville, in the chapel, please come on over to this sanctuary. Thank you for visitors. Thank you for coming. God bless you. But we ask that all non-members exit as soon as possible. <laughs>